Thank you for attending our virtual event tonight. My name is Derek Yonai, and I am the director of the Koch Center for Leadership and Ethics at Emporia State University. Tonight, we launch our first live Q&A session with our Governance, Law, and Economics speaker. The Governance, Law, and Economics lecture series is designed to highlight the three institutions that must work together to support and defend a free civil society. Those institutions are good governance, the rule of law, and market-based institutions. An important institution for a free society is a free press. Tonight, we have Kelly McBride, Senior Vice President and the Craig Newmark Journalism Ethics Chair of the Craig Newmark Center for Ethics and Leadership at the Pointer Institute. We'll be joining her mid-conversation. As an economist, that's a really neat way of putting it, that is from the bottom up. And we have a follow-up question, which is, as much as people are trying to be sort of value neutral, um, people do have internal biases. And what do reporters do to help sort of keep those things in check? So value neutral. I, I wouldn't agree with value neutral. I would say that journalists have values even beyond just like the value of truth. Um, so they value justice. They value equality. They value... Um, they, they value transparency, they value fairness. Um, and, and you're right, journalists do have biases. I, I literally just today published a um, column for National Public Radio, which is the third job that I have is as the public editor of National Public Radio. And I looked at these cases that happened within the last week one was President Trump was quoted, was interviewed in a press conference about the shooting in Kenosha. And President Trump said, um, it looks like it was self-defense. And NPR inserted, President Trump said, comma, without evidence. It looks like it was self-defense. Um, now there's an argument to be said that there is evidence, but the, but the point is, is that they decided that the president at that point needed to be sort of fact-checked, right? And, and so they put a qualifier in. Literally in the same news cycle, they published um, another team at NPR, the Code Switch team, which is a team that deals with race and racism and um, issues of, of how we get along as, as a society. They, they did a Q&A with an author who wrote a book called In Defense of Looting. They interviewed her on a lot of things. She said some crazy things that could easily be fact-checked and they did not fact-check her. So if you look at those two things, you can, you can assume a bias there, right? They fact-checked the president, they didn't fact-check this liberal author. But then complicating that, in, in my column, I describe all this, there's this third case where they're doing these interviews with voters. They went across the Southwest, David Green did a bunch of interviews, and many of the voters in the Southwest, in Arizona and New Mexico that they interviewed, um, said things that were also equally suspect, right? That were, that, that you could, bring a bunch of statistics or videos and show them and just say, look, you are just flat out wrong on this. Um, they didn't fact check those people either. Now, what I said in the column basically is that that insertion for the president was inappropriate. They should have definitely fact checked the author, but they were good to mildly push back on these audience members rather than do a full on fact check because the journalistic purpose of what they were doing was not to demonstrate that voters don't know what they're talking about when they make their decisions. The journalistic purpose was to, um, was to, to help me as a listener see inside the minds of somebody that I might not have a conversation with. So that was, I think, that sort of complicated things and it, and it screwed up my presumption of bias, right? Because they didn't, you know, so it's not as neat and, and easy as, yes, this organization is biased in this direction and that organization is biased in that direction. It's complicated. Um, the, the safety net 
is the system, right? So when we talk about objectivity in journalism, we are not talking about objectivity of the individual journalists or even the organization. We are talking about objectivity of process. And in all three of those cases, it was a failure of process that left the listener with not quite enough information to know what the real truth was. And the process is, is editing and, um, and, and copy editing and, um, ch and, and then also checking your own biases and trying to look at a piece with fresh eyes. So that actually raises a sort of a separate question I have in terms of how has the information age changed the ethics and journalism of maintaining that objectivity? Because it seems like the news cycle is a lot faster. So I'm, I'm probably really naive about this. I'm imagining like a reporter sitting there pounding away on an old school typewriter and then somebody's got to read copy and then it's got to get laid out. So you have time built in where you can fact check and you can check your sources. But now it seems like you can just pound it away on your iPad and hit send and it's out for the world to consume instantly. How has, how has that changed things? Well, so uh, in two very specific ways, one for the better, one for the worse. What you said is true. We are faster and we're also thinner in our news organizations. Um, I, so I've been in journalism for, for 30 plus years. I never wrote on a typewriter. So Derek, I think you're, <laughs> you're imagining because I'm pretty sure you're younger than me. Um, but, um, but when I worked at newspapers 18 years ago, I had multiple levels of editing, right? Like I had my line editor, there was always a second editor behind him or her, there was a copy edit, and then there was a proofread. And that was just for a regular piece. If it was a high stakes piece, it would have even more eyeballs on it. And that system, is much thinner. So yes, there are people in journalism who publish straight to the internet. Um, occasionally someone reads behind them. Um, but, um, um, and, in, and in most newsrooms now, they have realized that that's really dangerous. And so they try and bring at least one level of editing, but I used to get four. Um, now the way that it's better is that before the internet, it's, you know, we have a diversity problem in journalism. We really do. And the people who controlled which stories got told and which ideas were valuable did so through their own biases, right? And they were a bunch of white guys who were educated on the East Coast. And so you really there are stories that never would have seen the light of day that now because of the internet and we can see that like so that we lowered the means of production the barriers to production and that meant that some people could get their ideas onto the internet and into a public space who never would have been able to do that before and sometimes when they do that the thing goes viral and those are pieces that would have never gotten into um a mainstream publication prior to the internet. And that then has forced old school publications to recalibrate what they thought was news. So there's been a democratizing effect in addition to a, um, a sort of lowering of professional standards. So we have a follow-up from a student who wants to know, uh, why do news sources have biases uh, instead of just letting the public create their own judgment based off of what the article states? Well, you at some point have to, I, I think the other thing that we've learned in journalism is that you can't just be a stenographer, that that actually is pretty unhelpful for the public. Um, because if you just say, well, this person said this, and this person said this, and this person said this, at a certain point as a reader or as a consumer, there's so much information that you're gonna gravitate toward the people who tell you, well, here's what it really means or here's what the real truth is because who's got time to do all of that research? Um, so, so really that's a, that's a nice ideal, um, but in reality, that's not what consumers want. Okay. So 
I'm just kind of curious because I've done some research on the anti-intellectualism within the U.S. over the last several years. And how, if I want objective news, how do I avoid getting into sort of that echo chamber of just hearing things that reconfirm what it is I already believe to be the truth? Um, I mean, I believe it actually starts in your real life and who you surround yourself in your real life, because it turns out that whatever you consume online tends to reflect what your real social situation looks like. And so if the people that you are inviting over for your socially distanced dinners these days all think the same thing that you think, it's likely that your social media is going to reflect that. But if in your real life you have, um, you have a diverse set of um, people, and, and, and I mean diversity in all the ways, right? Um, age diversity, um, religious diversity, economic diversity, um, all of the ways. Um, those, then your social life, your social media life is probably going to reflect that. Um, so, and, and it's really, it's really much harder. People recommend, you know, the sort of the, the shortcut to just doing it online is to make sure that you are getting diverse political viewpoints. I actually prefer to do, to do it a little differently and to think more about, um, I think about it the way I think about nutrition, right? Like I need, sometimes I need food really fast, right? And sometimes every day I need information really fast. So I need a couple of products that summarize and give me rundowns and go shallow and wide, right? And so everybody needs something like that. Um, and then I need some products that I find really entertaining that just are like funny and well-written and about topics that I don't necessarily need to know about, but I really want to know about. Um, and so I found a couple of products like that. And then I also need some products that can, um, can challenge my sensibilities, right? And so um, I'm, I subscribe to like a couple of business products because that's not really like my thing. So, um, and I find that if I get the ones that are really well-written, that, that I can digest them and I can learn something about a part of the world that is very different from where I live, working in a nonprofit um, outside of New York City. So, so I actually think that you're probably gonna be more successful rather than just thinking about a diversity of political viewpoints. If you think about um, the types of products that you're consuming and you try and be a little deliberate about your media diet that way. Okay, and related, one of our students wants to know, how, do you, how should you interpret COVID-19 news stories from the major news agencies when sometimes they conflict with one another? So first of all, you should figure out what you need to know about COVID-19 and then go look for that information. And I will tell you that if you are not living in a major metropolitan area, then you probably are not getting the news that you need. I am not getting the news that I need around COVID-19, right? So what do I need to know? I wanna know what is the hospital capacity in my county, right? Not in my state. I wanna know in my county, how is it? And how is that different from last week? I want a running count. I want a weekly number of how many hospital beds are available. Um, because if I see that number getting smaller and smaller, then I know that there's reason to, to be concerned. And I think that um, local news has done a fairly abysmal job on COVID-19. I also wanna know like some of the standard numbers that you're seeing, but I want them presented to me in the same way every day, right? Like I want a dashboard that shows me in my county, right? So I live in a media market that has like eight counties in it. I don't want to know the whole media market. I want to know in my county, um, what's, the, what's the positivity rate? What's the infection rate per 100,000 people? Not just the raw infection rate. Um, 
How many deaths? That's interesting, but um, it's actually not a helpful number. It doesn't help you make decisions. Um, and then I want to hear from public officials. And um, I, you know, I think that um, most news organ local news organizations have done a done a bad job because they either don't have the the programming bandwidth, right, like the design capabilities and the computer capabilities to repeatedly bring these numbers in and present them in a um, understandable way or they don't have the leadership. So another student follows up with the question of, you know, COVID-19 is a very big topic and how hard is it for journalists to accurately report on something that seems to be uh, changing daily with new information coming out? Uh, how hard has that made it for journalists to accurately report what's going on? You know, so the the challenge is for news organizations right so i would say um national public radio has done really well on COVID 19. why is that well what are their strengths health reporting economic reporting science reporting um, arts and entertainment reporting government reporting right so they have those five strengths and you have to tell that story on those on that level um, it's not an individual, as an individual journalist, you can't possibly tell the whole story of COVID-19. That's crazy. You have to pick what is the narrow part of this story that you're going to look at and how are you going to get really, really smart expert, treat it like a beat that you're actually going to cover just that narrow swath of it as an individual journalist. Because if you're trying to, to sweep wide, you're right, it's way too big, you'll never get it. Now, when it comes, to, and that's, in the, when, when you talk about changing information, that's why you need to go narrow and deep, right? If you are a health reporter, you have to understand the science. You have to understand immunology. You have to understand how science actually advances on this topic. And um, it's crazy to think that you could just step in on day one and cover the story well. Um, you really do need, um, you need to develop expertise because you need to be able to make those judgments, right? You can't just be a stenographer and say, here's what this person says, here's what that person says. A, this is a classic example of why that won't work. So we have some people who are saying things that we know are wrong. Um, we have some people saying things that can be demonstrated to be right, but they're not popular, and so we don't report them. So it's really, um, it really is a great example of why you need to make judgments as a journalist about what the truth really is, and then tell your audience, here's what the truth is, and here's why this is the truth. So if we're talking about the local media and how, um, as you said, they kind of let us down a little bit. You know, I have a question because when I was in uh, Florida, our local newspaper was bought by a large chain. And one of the first things they did to save money was they cut the news staff and reporters were calling me and they were telling me that, you know, I'm, they may not be my contact anymore because they may not have a job. Um, how does, how does that affect the quality of local journalism? And if you're a local outlet, what could you do to still do a good job in spite of the fact that maybe the marketing department's getting an inflow of cash, but not the newsroom? Well, I mean, the economy that supports local journalism has been decimated. Um, we don't have a good economic model for local journalism right now. We have a couple of bright spots that are startup digital publications that are nonprofit or um, some of them are for-profit but they have alternative revenue sources like events. Um, but if you're talking about the local newspaper, um, that's a really dark, bleak picture right now. It's, I don't see it getting better anytime soon. And so what you describe, right, the chains were the first, but, but in the last 10 years, it's been every newspaper. The money just isn't there. So you, it's almost crazy to think that local newspapers as a printed product are going to survive 
another 20 years because I don't think they will. Um, the television market um, is looking at a similar cliff as more and more people cut the cord because most of the time, if you're watching local television, you're doing it through a local cable provider. And so once everybody cuts the cord, I mean, I cut the cord a long time ago, and I can tell you that that's the thing that I find the hardest to, to watch is um, local television. And, and I don't think anybody knows the answer to what's going to happen to the local television market. So, so then you have these alternative products or public media, and none of them have the strength or the bandwidth that local newspapers did in their heyday 20 years ago. And, um, I, and, and, and let me tell you why I really worry about this. Um, so there's a lot of studies that show that when consumers trust the media, it's because they trust their local media. Um, and when consumers stop consuming local media, they become less civically engaged. When you become less civically engaged, you don't trust the democratic process. So you stop participating in it. So you get lower and lower voting rates. So you can see like this cascading set of dominoes, um, but, but it all starts with local media. And I mean, I wonder, I think I, I stay up at night thinking about this. I think that we're gonna have to have some sort of public solution for local journalism. I don't know what it is, but I, I, I don't think that the free market's gonna support local journalism. We're running a little short on time, but I would be remiss if I didn't get a chance to ask you, could you tell us a little bit about what the Newmark Center does? Yeah, so what we do is um, we try and that whole like, ethics come from the ground up, we try and intervene in that process and encourage news organizations to do the right thing and to serve their audience. Um, and we do it in a number of ways. We do it by sort of publicly, not shaming, but declaring best practices like around sexual assault or suicide coverage or coverage of mass shootings or coverage of COVID-19. Um, business practices even. Um, we work, we do training for journalists. Um, and so we help individual journalists learn how to become better ethical decision makers. And then the most influential thing we do is we work directly with news organizations. We help them write their policies. We help them enforce their policies as consultants. We um, train their journalists and we, um, we walk alongside them and help them make decisions when they have really complicated um, gnarly stories that they're working through. Cool. In the amount of time we have left, what is the one takeaway you would love our audience to walk away with tonight? Um, as a news consumer, you have a massive amount of responsibility here. Um, you have to um, own your own news consumption and your own participation in the marketplace of ideas. Um, and you have to own your, um, what you share, what you propagate, whether it's sending articles to your friends and neighbors or whether it's just posting things randomly on Facebook. Um, if you don't, it used to be that we asked editors to sort the news for you and hand you sort of a full package wrapped up with a bow. Here's what you need to know. That doesn't exist anymore. You are now the editor. And if you don't take responsibility for that, and I know a lot of super educated people who literally do not consume news responsibly at all. They're horrible. Um, if you don't take responsibility for that, then you're part of the problem. Perfect. Kelly, thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your time. And thank you everybody out there for joining our first virtual Q&A session with one of our GLE speakers. Before we call it a night, I have two quick announcements. The first is that on September 23rd, we will be releasing Brian Kaplan's GLE lecture on his graphic novel, Open Borders. And then a week later, September 30th at 6 p.m. Central, 
we'll be doing another live Q&A with Dr. Kaplan. So if you're interested, next week, go over to www.emporia.edu backslash live and register for our event and we'll get you the Zoom link for that. And if you're interested in any other events we're doing, follow us on Facebook at Koch Center ESU. Otherwise, again, thank you for coming tonight. Stay well, stay safe, and please be good to each other. Good night. <laughs>